Again, let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We've got a fantastic guest writing about one of the great issues of our time, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We've been thinking and talking about future uh, free speech and academic freedom in higher education on the forum for several years. We've had several great panels and sessions talking about this from all kinds of angles, everything from what is the role of faculty departments in trying to manage or support free speech to the role of presidents, to the role of outside organizations like the uh, AE, or, excuse me, uh, the AUP. Now, we are going to approach this from a bit of a different angle with the help of a wonderful writer uh, Len Gutkin is a writer who has done, among other things, a really nifty book about the figure of the dandy in late 19th century literature, but also for a few years, the Chronicle of Higher Education, he's been writing a series of fascinating newsletters and articles about free speech in higher education. He's been tackling this from a whole bunch of directions, everything from religion and race to governance to state and national politics. And I've just been eager to get him on the show because he's a terrific writer, he's a fascinating fascinating thinker, and I think a great guide to our topic. So without any further ado, let me bring him up on stage. Hello, Len Gutkin. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. Oh, a pleasure, a pleasure. Where have we found you today? Uh, I'm in Wheaton, Maryland, in my home. Uh, it's uh, oh. a ways outside of D.C. Excellent, excellent. And you have a wonderful setting. You've got a great big wing chair, and you've got some nice uh, uh, cloth and weaving behind it. It looks delicious. Well, Len, we have a, a habit on the forum where we ask people to introduce themselves, not by talking about their past, but about their future. I'm curious, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big topics that concern you and uh, what are some of your projects? Sure. So I'm, I am actually working on a, a book. It's sort of in the proposal stage uh, on some of the topics that you've already mentioned, the history of academic freedom and free speech in mm -hmm. American uh, institutions of higher education. Uh, and it's geared towards sort of trying to understand what's happened in the last, I would say, 10 years, beginning in around 2013 or 2014, mm -hmm. uh, and culminating, I would say, in the present. I think that the, uh, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about this today, but the events on campus around the Israel-Gaza war uh, have, have uh, offered a kind of neat and tragic bookend to the tale I want to tell about what's happened to campus in the last decade or so. Excellent. Well, good luck writing that. And uh, when when it hits print and ebook format, please let me know so we can bring you back. I would be glad to spread the word. Thank you. Uh, friends, if you're new to the Future Trends Forum, what I usually do is I interrogate our poor guest uh, with a couple of questions to start with. But then I get rid of uh, my role with the mic and give it over to you. So as we start talking, you start thinking about what questions you'd like to ask. What, uh, what comments you'd like to share? What ideas do you think really matter for you in your work and in your life when it comes to free speech in academia? So I, I, let me just start off by saying, or asking Len, um, you mentioned 2013 or so, and I'm curious, what happened then? What started off this current wave of free speech controversy? Yeah, it's a great question and one that I, I you know, I don't in fact have the answer to. I think there are a, a range of answers. Some are offered by uh, thinkers like the psychologist Jonathan Haidt, uh, who, in his view, the kind of new um, period of activism, student activism, uh, very much centered around feelings, around uh, a sense of vulnerability on the part of the students. In his view, it's a kind of downstream effect uh, of um, uh, technological uh, sort of technologically induced psychological changes on the part of late adolescence. I'm uh, not dismissive of that explanation, uh, nor am I entirely convinced by it. Um, so I, you know, I don't frankly know. Something changes radically in that period in, in my experience, and I've checked with a number of people, including people. So I was in, I was finishing my PhD in 2013. Uh, which uh, was the period of some very uh, sort of impassioned and, and uh, um, upsetting, I think, for people on all sides of these issues, uh, protests in, at Ivy League schools like Yale and Harvard. Um, you know, that's, that's when it seems to me that things changed, that, that the student culture changed uh, quite dramatically uh, at that point. 
Um, and when I've asked uh, people who are older, quite a bit older, who have been in the academy for a very long time, they tend to corroborate that point of view. Uh, my own uh, sort of the, the larger historical spread that I think we're seeing is something like a, uh, at least a bicyclic, maybe a tricyclic narrative mm -hmm. in which the student activism that first emerged uh, in the late 1960s and the mid to the late 1960s, uh, which then really evaporated uh, in the 1970s and into the early 1980s, um, was uh, resuscitated in a, a different key, much less uh, militant, uh, much more feelings-based uh, in ways both good and bad in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, and then uh, went into a kind of uh, uh, a kind of quiescence again, uh, and uh, in the middle of the uh, 2010s uh, reemerged. And I, those those are the three sort of points uh, or, or climaxes that I see. And I think accounting for both the continuities and some of the really sharp differences between those three periods is the work of anybody trying to understand the politics of the academy at present. Other really galvanizing events in this in the most recent part of the history are uh, the election of Donald Trump. Uh, mm -hmm. certainly, uh, which I think seemed to authorize or confirm many of the worst suspicions of, uh, let's say, the campus activist left. Uh, the murder of George Floyd in the middle of the COVID pandemic, uh, again, supercharged what was already a very kind of heated situation. Um, so in the most recent period, I think those are what we're seeing. You know, those are the, the, the most salient events. And I'm hardly original in saying that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's a that's a very very um, uh, nicely framed answer. We have um, in the in the chat our friend Mark Rush, who is a poli sci and law professor, points out that the country has endured numerous cycles of speech suppression: World War One, McCarthyism, now. Uh, and then Mark Corbett Wilson takes a different tack and says student activism had been evaporated; it was crushed by Reagan Republicans. Um, so yeah, I would. I think that's probably not quite right. If you look at, um, uh, there's a very good book on campus culture, student culture by uh, Harwitz, Lefkowitz Harwitz is her last name. I'm blanking on her first name, but she's now an emerita historian at uh, Wellesley. Uh, in her construction, no, it's it's uh, at least as as she puts it, it's not simply that it was crushed. I mean, things changed. One of the things that changed is that the stimulus of the draft, which was a real prod toward campus militancy stopped being there. I mean, with the end of the Vietnam War, there was less of a, you know, so by the, you know, by the late seventies, things were just changing profoundly. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, that's a, it's a hard question, but I, I, I think that things changed for reasons other than the Reagan administration. In the, in the chat, my, my dear friend, Joel and Parker says her first name is Helen. Um, and he got that for us. Um, we have um uh, that's well thank you for saying that thank you for saying that and and thank you friends in the chat already the conversation is picking up um i, I guess i have a second question which is a another large you know framing question which is we often hear the discussions around free speech and academic freedom as a kind of overlapping but not completely coincident venn diagram mm -hmm. the academic freedom is a a form of free speech, but it has certain limitations that we don't associate with free speech in the larger nation. Do, do you, can you just say a bit about that, that intersection or the overlap between free speech and academic freedom? Sure. Yeah, it's one of the hardest questions, I think, about the theory of academic freedom, uh, because the theory of academic freedom and the law of academic freedom are not coincident. Mm -hmm. uh, the theory of academic freedom informs the law of academic freedom, but the law, the constitutional law of academic freedom is primarily applicable, of course, to public universities. Uh, you know, where it's had uh, a kind of, it's, it really was because of McCarthyite persecutions and resistance on the part of activist faculty members to those persecutions, that a series of really important decisions uh, in the 50s and 1960s made uh, academic freedom of First Amendment issue uh, in public universities. And that's a tremendously fascinating history, and it maps on only very imperfectly to the private school situation. So there are schools uh, like Stanford that are, in theory, and maybe in law, you'd have to ask somebody else, uh, committed to something like a First Amendment uh, style um, academic freedom norm. Uh, there are other 
schools, many of the schools in uh, Massachusetts, maybe all of the schools in Massachusetts, I think, uh, which are bound by their by the promises of their contract and mission in a way that's hmm. really more uh, sturdy than in many other states. That's a state by state thing. Hmm. But right, hmm. the the law of academic freedom uh, is um, uh, is is super complex, um, and it, it brings academic freedom into into a you know into the realm of speech, which is of course not primarily what academic freedom is. It's not it's not a free speech right as. Uh, it's not primarily free speech, right? Yeah. Uh, any of its critics want to say. Yeah. Oh, it's a complex overlap, and uh, thank you for that. I, I I think very elegant tour. Um, okay. yeah, well, in fact, I'll give you a um, because it's become an issue again, very starkly, with the attempt uh, of Ron DeSantis to ban the uh, Students for Justice in Palestine, mm -hmm. um, which is a student group, um, and is in florida and in all states at public universities students have the right of association that's actually part of an academic freedom right it doesn't apply to faculty it applies to students in this case hmm. Hmm. um and desantis can't do that i mean he's realized now that he can't do that um columbia university as i'm sure you know has temporarily suspended the sjp and brandeis university has banned it and uh, uh entirely uh which they probably can do uh, legally, uh, but here's a case where a 1972 Supreme Court case uh, has made the law of academic freedom result in a much sturdier protection uh, in public universities than in private ones when it comes to student groups and, and student association. So that's a very, very important distinction to make between public and private there. Uh, friends, uh, I have a couple more questions to ask, but already your questions are coming in. Uh, and we have some questions from two people who couldn't make it. Uh, so I want to make sure we get those. And the first I want to ask is from our, our friend in Malta. Um, and since it's getting later and later at night there, I want to give him a chance to uh, ask first. Uh, and Phil asks, I teach Chinese students in the People's Republic of China using WeChat and consciously self-limit discussion, knowing that we're probably monitored. <laughs> to what extent has sensible sensitivity in academia become self-censorship? I hope not anything like to the extent uh, in the PRC. Um, and uh, but yeah, that's a, I mean that's a great question that that I suspect can be answered better by uh, many of the people here who uh, uh, have, have spent time in the classroom recently uh, than by myself. I've, I've certainly heard sort of anecdotally about uh, all kinds of uh, kind of neurotic self censorship. I've also heard you know from people who feel that the whole issue is overblown, that that the uh, need to self-censor has been overstated by uh, various kinds of interested uh, ideological actors, usually on the right. And so I, I, I wait to be informed, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, let me just let me just volunteer the forum. If uh, if any of you would like to share such a story or an observation about that, please feel free to uh, use the chat box. Um, if you would rather do that anonymously, please uh, direct message me, and uh, I'll be happy to share your story without sharing your name. Uh, in the in the chat, to go back to your previous point, Len, uh, Mark Rush adds uh, another aspect, which is different accreditors. Um, so different accrediting agencies. Uh, and the three of us have been talking about the current uh, American Bar Association trying to uh, implement or considering implementing a new uh, free speech law um, for accreditation there. Um, so if anyone would like to, so first, Phil, thank you for that great question. Um, and uh, um, I'd love to hear some time about uh, what you think of teaching with WeChat. Um, but if, uh, uh, if anyone wants to share a story about that, please, please feel free. Um, we have a question from um, one person who can't make it here today, um, and that's our good friend, Don Shalas. And da Don asks, what do you make of Charlie Kirk and the Turning Point USA's professor watch list? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, uh, the professor watch list, and it has, you know, predecessors, I think, from uh, uh, David Horowitz had a version of this, right, going way back. Mm -hmm. It's obviously meant to chill speech. Um, it maybe has that effect to some extent. Um, on the other hand, I think it can be about, I've talked to faculty members on these lists who, who feel that it's a badge of honor. Mm. Uh, I think yeah. that it's, um, as long as, you know, as long as institutions are committed in the way that they're supposed to be, 
to academic freedom and to protecting faculty members from political persecution, Professor Watchlist should be sort of a joke and not an emergency. Um, if it becomes really dangerous, I would say it's less Charlie Kirk's fault uh, than it is the fault of those state legislators uh, who Ooh. permit certain kinds of public pressure, which is maybe uh, given momentum by the professor watch list to affect administrative decisions. Um, hmm. You know, Kirk would say uh, he's just a he's a he's an activist journalist on the right, hmm. uh, uh, arguing for a certain kind of transparency, and I think that that is, uh, you know, from a legal standpoint, that's just undeniable. He has the right to assemble these watch lists, and so it's up to institutions and administrators to uh, to respond appropriately, which is really to say to not respond at all uh, when they get pressure uh, from people, uh, parents, donors, various constituents uh, to act on these watch lists, to punish or investigate or whatever. It's the, the burden of responsibility is on the institution. Mm -hmm. And again, we come, we come back to the different contours that you mentioned before, the difference between public and private institutions, um, the uh, issue of accreditation that uh, that Mark mentioned. Um, well, this is, well, first of all, Don, that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for that answer. This is one key piece of, of, of the story. Um, we have another question that came in here from Leslie Harris, and let me put this up on the screen so you can all see. Um, I wonder how universities can balance the desire for free speech and the responsibility to protect their students from harm. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I think that's become sort of the question uh, of the last few years. And uh, we at the Chronicle Review have run a number of sort of point, counterpoint um, uh, debates uh, by people on different sides of that uh, issue. It's become, I think, uh, in my own view, uh, uh, the sort of a certain kind of incoherence of the harm theory uh, has uh, become very palpable after the uh, outbreak of all of these protests over Israel Gaza mm. um, because you have multiple sides of protesters claiming harm um, mm -hmm. symbolic harm not physical or literal harm that's obviously not appropriate uh, and appealing to the uh, institution for protection from these harms and the institution uh, these, the institutions are unable to adjudicate between these rival claims um, and are now, I suspect, or I know, because they've issued statements very much to this effect, regretting ever having gotten into the harm adjudication business uh, now that it's become totally impossible. Um, and so I expect that we'll see uh, in the future, at least when it comes to institutional statements about uh, solidarity with the uh, harms or traumas of one group or another group, I think we'll see much less of that. Um, when it comes to harm in the classroom, I think that's a more uh, that that issue will probably persist in various ways. Um, hmm. uh, but I, I suspect even there, institutions will there may be downstream effects where they say, "Look, we need to we need to uh, weigh in less, um, be less certain about whose harms count or whose harms we recognize, um, because it's getting us in trouble or tying us into knots." Um, you know, I think um, Claudine Gay, who's the new president mm -hmm. of Harvard, was raked over the coals for uh, what was perceived by many as a sort of insufficiently aghast statement over the uh, massacre on October the 7th uh, in Israel. And, um, you know, in my view, her statement was basically fine. She said a terrible thing happened and uh, we our hearts are with everybody. But her predecessor, and this didn't happen under Claudine Gay, uh, the previous president, who was an interim president at Harvard, uh, had at the outbreak of the war in Ukraine gone sort of full, I mean, they rose the, they rose the Ukrainian flag on Harvard Yard, emails were sent out and so on and so forth. There was a kind of, you know, Harvard became a kind of national outpost of Ukrainian patriotic fervor. And so in that context, uh, and no fault of her own, you can see why Claudine Gay's statement seemed rather pallid. And I think that a lot of uh, presidents, whether they announce what they're doing explicitly as Maude Mandel has at, at uh, Williams College or whether they just sort of uh, under the radar decide that they're gonna shut up <laughs> going forward, 
will do something like what Maude Mandel has done and say, you know, no matter what happens now in the world, there's no need to hear from me about it. I, you know, um, I'm unless it affects, you know, Williams or Harvard directly, uh, is, you know, I think we'll see a lot more of that. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, you, you covered a lot of ground there, um, Len. Uh, I just, um, if, if I could, if I could ask um, a question about something that you've written quite a lot about, you, you mentioned the, or the differences between speech, such as the university proclaiming solidarity with Ukraine against Russia, but then you zoomed into the question of classrooms and, and following uh, Leslie's excellent question, you said that the question of classroom harm and speech is likely to persist. You, one of the fascinating stories around these lines is the Hamlin University case, uh, where uh, an adjunct art professor uh, taught an image of uh, the Prophet Muhammad and things blew up from there. Um, and I, I'm curious if, you, if, if it wouldn't be too much, if you could speak a bit about the about Hamlin, how that's unfolded and what that might tell us about the free speech and higher education and these questions of harm and academic freedom. Uh, sure, yeah, I'd love to. Um, so Hamline is, a, um, for those of you who don't know the story, it's a, the, the quick and dirty version is that an adjunct professor of art history on a year-to-year -year contract in a, an art history course showed a very famous 14th century image of the prophet Muhammad after several warnings, uh, trigger warnings uh, or, or uh, whatever, uh, because she had a number of devout Muslim students in the class. Uh, they complained anyway, and she was not rehired. Uh, and um, the AUP got involved. They issued a, a decision basically against Hamline, although they didn't formally censure them because they were hoping that Hamline would uh, reform. Hamline sort of dug in its heels. Um, the story gets very complicated and very ugly. Um, but it's fascinating because, uh, not just because it's, I mean, it's fascinating in, in local terms. It involves clashes between uh, this um, uh, a Somali immigrant community that's quite uh, observant um, and more liberal uh, Muslim professors at Hamline. I mean, there's all kinds of journalistic interest, but the real interest is in how not novel the story is. If you look at the sort of longer history of uh, academic freedom and blasphemy concerns. Um, and this is where I think that, I mean, academic freedom is at root, or one way of thinking about it uh, as an intellectual historian is that it is at root uh, the refusal to recognize blasphemy claims in either scholarship uh, or in teaching. And that's, you know, that becomes very clear if you look at the 19th century cases in which, uh, when academic freedom didn't really exist in any particular way, in which scholars with formal appointments in Europe and to a lesser extent in America, where there was less developed uh, research profiles, uh, got into trouble. These are very famous people um, who got into trouble uh, and were fired or at least harassed uh, mm -hmm. what was you know basically scholarly uh, textual work on the Bible. That was the big issue. Mm -hmm. the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, scholars who were working on dating the composition of different portions of the Old Testament, uh, so on and so forth, all of which tended toward uh, a kind of secularizing uh, and, and relativizing uh, uh, attitude toward Christian scripture. Uh, and uh, you know people lost their jobs, Ernest Renan, uh, at the Collège de France was fired for suggesting in a lecture that Christ was, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a great human, but not a God man, mm -hmm. essentially. And that kind of thing happened over and over and over again. Uh, by the time you get to the uh, uh, 20th century in the United States, um, and even long after the AAUP has been uh, sort of founded in 1915 and has released this great statement on academic freedom, you continue to see uh controversy over religion in the classroom but there it doesn't tend to be about research it's not that they're getting mad at scholars for working on uh textual history of the bible or whatever uh, it's it's more for views expressed in class um so very continuous sort of sensitivity uh that we see so much of now and there's some wonderful and sort of funny uh episodes that are planted uh, in a, a great book by robert post and matthew fink and for the Common Good, 2006 uh, book by two law professors about the law and theory of academic freedom. It's short and very readable, and anybody interested in the topic should read this book. Uh, but the cases are, you know, they're sort of hilarious. There's one uh, in which a, 
a professor of classics at a school in Tennessee, a small like branch college of the university, I don't, I don't know what it's called, the University of Tennessee, public, uh -huh. public institution, is teaching a course on the classics and they're translating something from Greek. And the word hell comes up or a word that they translate as hell and then they start talking about hell. And he says, well, I, as a liberal Christian, don't, uh, this is 1940, by the way, yeah. as a liberal Christian, don't believe in um, eternal hellfire. And some of his students get angry and uh, try to get him fired. And I forget now what, whether he's fired or not, but it becomes one of the important day AUP cases of the period. And there are several other similar ones from the same period, either about expressions of insufficient respect toward Christian doctrine mm -hmm. or about uh, Darwinian uh, theory, which is uh -huh. controversial in that period, as I suppose it still is in our secondary uh -huh. uh, system. Um, but it does come to turn very much on the feelings of the students, right? Um, and that happens very well. That happens in the first half of the, of the 20th century. It's not a novel development. And this is one of the reasons I'm not entirely sold on the, the height model of, uh, you know, sensitivity mm -hmm. as a function of uh, mm -hmm. digital sensitization or whatever, because you, in fact, see enormous individual sensitivity around affronts to religion going very far back mm -hmm. in a, a far less technological age. And so I think this issue is just obviously very, very much with us right now. It's uh, the, the one of the, um, the, the many of the most salient cases do involve Islam. Um, their hamline is not alone, um, but they also involve Christian belief and, and uh, uh, Christian offense. So it's, uh, it will, I suspect, continue to be a thing until um, institutions uh, sort of recommit uh, to the to what is, uh, in my view, the fundamentally secular project of academic freedom. It's just, it comes out of a matrix of secular liberalism, small l liberalism, that, mm -hmm. that way it can't exist. And so it, it does require those uh, commitments. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a very, very great historical tour through this. Um, and I, I'm fascinated to hear that the that we get as far back as the 1940s, this question of student feelings as a driver for uh, responses to faculty uh, free speech. In the chat, Nancy W. corrects us both and points out that it's Hamlin, not Hamline. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I, I appreciate that. Um, we have more questions coming up, and I, I want to uh, make sure people get a chance to uh, put them up. And here's one that's this is actually perfect timing uh, for our friend Stephen Volk, who asks um, about the modern um, trend towards responses to freedom of speech. There's a number of contemporary critics like Yasha Monk and Barry Weiss attribute the current crisis in U.S. society to campus culture in terms of postmodernism, poststructuralism, critical race theory. Your thoughts? Uh, I... I tend to think that the like the the location of the affronts to campus freedom in those like critical or theoretical schools is probably very overstated. Um, there are, I think, ways in which so-called critical race theory has been institutionalized in DEI departments that might, uh, you know, that maybe there's some there there. But as a general rule, I'm not convinced that the like the, I mean, cr critical race theory, as I understand it, uh, is a is a race specific variation on a kind of demystifying sociology of law that goes back to the 1920s, mm. um, and it's it's uh, relativizing in much the same way that uh, secular attitudes toward religion are. It says you know, mm -hmm. law is uh, is a mask for various kinds of interests and. Uh, that's the kind of theory that, of course, should be debated intensively in universities. And so I think that those those become sort of boogeymen uh, for some observers on the more conservative side of the spectrum. Uh, but if you if you look more closely, I doubt that they're responsible in the ways that they're supposed to be, except insofar as they've been um, uh, sort of crudely institutionalized in non-academic departments uh elsewhere in the university that is uh various kinds of administrative departments um that's that's how it looks to me and, and ditto for post-structuralism and you know those are the buzzwords if you look at the sort of round of books that came out about academic uh, freedom in the um 
uh, in the mid '90s, uh, which were sort of trying to process this earlier round of uh, uh, controversy over free speech and academic freedom and so on. And critical race theory was uh, not on the agenda at that point, but certainly post-structuralism and post-modernism were. And yeah, there's like a sophisticated version of the argument that says something like, well, academic freedom depends on uh, a, a, a theory of objective truth. Uh, it, it requires mm. truth for its motivation. And so if you espouse relativistic epistemological theories, then it, it loses its yeah. warrant or something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I think it has more to do with uh, uh, less theoretical kinds of motivation again, primarily around taboos, uh, sacred objects, things that one doesn't want uh, offended or transgressed or insulted. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, th that's a very um, solid response to a, a terrific question. Uh, Stephen, I've, I've just, I'm waiting for Monk's book to arrive uh, in my hopper right now, actually. Um, and so I, I, I really appreciate, Len, your, your, your reframing of this. Um, in fact, if I could, friends, just just you know, uh, just rem to remind everybody, please uh, feel free to ask questions. Again, the bottom of the screen, that Q and A box, uh, just you know, click that question mark and type it in. And if you want to join us on stage, um, this is one of those sessions where it seems like you have to have a beard in order to be on screen, but it's not true. It's not true. Any anybody anybody's allowed, regardless of your facial configuration. But I do want to pull one question that has kind of emerged from the chat. A few different people called Mark actually uh, have raised this, that in the Hamlin story, there was a, one of the issues was that the professor in question was an adjunct. <clears throat> what do you think of the difference between institutional support in terms of free speech for tenure track faculty versus adjuncts, in which case in the United States, of course, in the past you know, 20 years, we've seen the former population shrink and the uh, adjunct population swell to being the largest population of instructors we now have. Oh, yeah. I mean, adjuncts don't have protection. I mean, there's just I mean, as we saw in the Hamlet, I mean, there just there isn't any. Um, and I think even even administrations more positively disposed toward free speech are going to sacrifice an adjunct if if there's too much external pressure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the adjunctification is just a it's like a horrible accelerant of uh, of of the diminution of free speech and academic academic freedom, let's say be precise uh, as a force on campus. I don't think it's the cause of the new skepticism toward academic freedom. I think it's more like a, a, an amplifying hmm. a factor uh, that you know, is, is making everything worse, but, but not to my mind the cause. Well, I do wonder, uh, we asked the question collaboratively before, but if anybody has run into uh, instances of self-censorship, and I think that would be one where the adjunct versus tenure track would be mm -hmm. very precise. Um, thank you, Len. I, I, I appreciate that answer. And um, tenure versus pre-tenure. I mean, I think that this has made uh, tenure, you know, tenure track, but not tenured faculty members. Uh -huh. Again, anecdotally, in my experience, are much more nervous than they used to be. Um, but, but again, others deny that. So it's you know, it's one of those sort of empirical. Sociological questions that's that's hard to answer, and it's easy to assume that the answer is whatever ever sort of lines up with your ideological priors. Mm -hmm. Well said. Uh, we have a question from uh, another friend who couldn't make it today, but this is uh, a friend who has co-authored a book on academic freedom, uh, Michael Derbe, uh, and was also a great guest uh, on the program last year. Uh, and he wants to know if you could expand a bit on your recent writing about the free speech of administrators um, and, and how that differs from sure uh, yeah it's I have to say it's the question that I um, it turns out it's um, one of the trickiest questions in the uh, in in the book and depending on who you ask you get depending on which expert you ask you get very very different answers so um, you know when I did write about free speech of administrators uh, Brian Leiter, who's a law professor and philosopher at Chicago, wrote to me and he was like, well, administrators just don't have free speech as administrators uh, at all. And uh, any version of the theory that thinks that they do is, is confused. Um, and I, um, I'm sympathetic to that as a norm. I don't think it is the case in the theory, as far as I can tell, or in like AAUP case law. So the question is, um, 
uh, when administrators speak out, uh, let's say, uh, extramurally uh, or intramurally, but on charged political topics, uh, should are they limiting? This is one version of the question. Are they limiting the free speech of their faculty members or not? So this came up, comes up in various settings. So all of the chancellors of the University of California system several years ago signed a letter about the uh, BDS movement uh, in which they said that the boycott, divest, and sanction movement against Israel is wrong, violates academic freedom, and uh, they're not interested in it. Uh, I mean, it was a page long. And uh, they um, there was a sort of campus outcry from faculty members who uh, support BDS, and they said, well, uh, uh, this is awfully chilling. Like the, the most powerful people in this system are telling me that my political position uh, is like formally um, not prohibited, but formally disputed uh, by the by the University of California. And what Carol Crist said in response to that was, well, I wasn't speaking, you know, as uh, I was just speaking in my own capacity as an administrator. Yeah. That's a citizen and, and scholar, not as an administrator. Yeah. Hmm. Check me on the facts on this, but I think that's how she responded. And that seems unconvincing to me. Uh, you know, I, I could imagine good reasons to prevent uh, administrators at the very top of uh, the administration from making political statements, extramural or intramural political statements of that sort, uh, on the theory that it chills faculty and student speech. Um, but the case, I mean, the, the law gets super complicated at public places around this. Uh, the, the, there's a famous case uh, about a uh, Leonard Jeffries from the 1990s, uh, who was the chair of the Black Studies Department at uh, City College. Mm -hmm. And he had made a bunch of uh, public speeches uh, in which he like accused the Jews of having a special role in the slave trade, and he propounded mm -hmm. the theory of um, uh, sort of melanin-based superiority of people of African descent over lighter-skinned people. He had a bunch of weird ideas, and he happened to be the chair of this department. And there was a series of court cases they, uh, in which they tried to fire him from his chair, from his position as chair. Uh, they weren't trying to get rid of him from the faculty. It was obvious to everybody at the time, and I think it might be less obvious now. I think the climate has changed in some way. It was obvious to everybody at the time that Leonard Jeffries was well within his rights to say all of these things as a faculty member, but that as an administrator and a, you know an administrator at the bottom of the you know he's a chair he wasn't a dean or anything but as a as a chair he wasn't within his rights to say these things and keep his chairship. And the case was uh, twice uh, the appellate that he was fired from the chair. He sued. He won twice in the I think Second Circuit uh on academic freedom grounds on uh, the constitutionally uh inflected academic freedom grounds that were then recognized by the courts uh on a third go round the supreme court remanded the case to the uh to the appellate court not on um, academic freedom grounds but on a newly decided law about public employee speech oh. those are complicated this is pre garcetti so it wasn't garcetti um, and said, look, actually, you got this wrong. Think about it again. And in this time, the Second Circuit said, OK, Jeffries can be removed from the chair. Um, but the point is, at least at that point, it was a super obscure. It was obscure. It was unclear to the courts how this should go. And I don't know what the law looks like in cases about this since that very famous case. Um, but it's confusing, I guess, is what I would say. And of the experts that I've spoken with, including Brian Leiter, including uh, Henry Reichman, formerly uh, you know head of the AUP, who has several books on academic freedom, uh, they all give me sort of different versions. I, I can't get a. Um, there doesn't seem to be, as far as I can tell, settled consensus wow. on this issue. Well, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. And 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 administrator, we've been talking about department heads and presidents. But does does that also cover the full range of non-faculty staff from custodians and librarians, technologists and grants officers, deans and uh, vice provosts? Uh, so I think the answer is no, uh, as far as I understand, um, that public employee law uh, does not 
protect non-academic faculty members in the same way that it, or non-academic employees in the same way that it protects academic employees. Uh, but this again is a complicated question that I am not in fact qualified to, <laughs> to weigh in on. Um, but my understanding is, is that the answer is no, uh, even after Garcetti, because there's something called the Garcetti exception. Garcetti is another uh, public employee speech decision uh, in which um, the, uh, a dissenting justice said, well, I hope that this new limitation in 2006 on public employee speech doesn't uh, doesn't compromise the long settled academic freedom, uh, the long settled First Amendment interest in academic freedom that the court has recognized. And the majority justice Kennedy said, we don't rule on whether it does or not. That's not the question before us. Um, and so that's that's the so-called Garcetti exception, as I understand it. And I think people, you know, people like, like Faisal Muhammad at Yale, who pays a lot of attention to this stuff, are sort of looking and watching and waiting to see when the Garcetti exception will be either affirmed uh, yeah. or, uh, <laughs> or, or destroyed. Um, there's a great article, uh, if I can recommend something from the Chronicle Review, by the, law, the Indiana law professor Steve Sanders, uh, we published it about a week ago. Um, we have Steve Sanders at the Chronicle Review, and he, unlike I, unlike me, he knows what you know. He knows he knows the law inside and out. He has a good rundown of the state of um, public employee law and and some of the recent both Supreme Court and appellate court decisions. Uh, so I would direct anybody to that. And I bet if you wrote to him and asked him for, he'd be a great guy to have on the show. Actually, he'd he, he'd uh, he knows the state inside and out. Excellent, excellent. Um... Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that detailed answer. That sounds like a real deep question um, uh, that we don't talk enough about, I think. Uh, and uh, you mentioned uh, Hank Reichman, who we've had on the forum as, as a guest. It was terrific. Uh, friends, we have about 12 minutes left. So uh, we have a couple of questions in the pipeline, but I want to make sure that each of you get a chance to ask your question or share your concerns. So again, if you'd like to either click the raised hand and join us on stage, uh, or just you know, hit the Q&A box and give us some, some questions, we'd be happy to see them. Uh, we have uh, a question that came in from Chris Aldrich uh, in the chat. He asked, I'm curious if anyone has any experience with free speech rankings, like that of the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, uh, and how well or poorly they've done with respect to the methodology and actual on the ground experience. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, Len, if you want to take a whack at uh, the fire, which most recently gave Harvard its worst possible rating. <laughs> yeah, so I um, have no insight into how that uh, sausage gets made. I don't know how the criteria are weighted. I do know that uh, journalists that I know who have tried to look into it um, are somewhat skeptical that the rankings are it's you know are, are scientific <laughs> um but i i don't know uh, more than that um i know there's a lot of skepticism about those rankings including from people who uh who tend to support the mission uh that fire is, is, is behind okay well thank you thank you and i i uh, those can be um, uh, those can be very interesting to consider, Chris. So uh, thank you for raising them. Um, we have uh, uh, another um, a return back to our question about um, uh, turning point and uh, and watch lists, uh, but from a different angle. Uh, and, and this question comes from uh, Joseph Robert Shaw asks, where do these faculty and student watch lists and free speech persecutions figure in the freedom picture in the light of plans to dismantle higher education put forth by people like Chris Rufo? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, I guess they're, I mean, I, I suppose you could see them as propaganda for the cause of Rufo and the other sort of new trustees at uh, New College um and uh yeah who knows i mean will he implement some kind of <laughs> watch list style surveillance system at new college that probably won't go over well um yeah it's a great question i i guess i would see it you know primarily they're they're kind of propaganda for the cause that um perhaps helps rufo uh, and other activists in that kind of sphere uh convince politicians uh, to, to let them have their way. Well, that's, uh, that's a good answer. 
uh, I, I don't mean good as in that's a happy and delightful thing to contemplate. Right. It's, a, it's a, a, a very, very uh, solid answer. Uh, thank you, uh, Joseph, for uh, for the question. And thanks, Don, for uh, raising this to begin with. Uh, the chat box has been going in a whole bunch of different directions. Uh, Mark Robert Wilson takes us back to uh, Ward Churchill's case, which is very interesting for a professor who uh, specifically gets in trouble for his speech. Uh, we've also had some uh, good questions or some good notes about the difference between tenure track and uh, adjunct uh, faculty. And um, uh, a couple of notes on law. Uh, Phil Lingard mentions the use of SLAP laws to uh, silence journalists, which may not be impacting uh, faculty. And uh, Lynn, uh, Carl Aho takes uh, issue with mentioning Brian Leiter um, because he uh, points out that, uh, quote, Brian Leiter is notoriously litig litigious about the speech of others, especially grad students. Um, and so I, I, I thought I'm not, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not aware that he uh, has sued grad students. Or not. I, you know, I, uh, but I, I do. I, I think he's a, uh, a serious thinker about academic freedom and, and what it entails. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to share that, and uh, and of course, um, uh, friends, if you like, uh, I can I can uh, share extracts from the chat uh, anonymized on a blog post along with a recording of this. So let let me know if if you'd like me not to do that um, in the chat. Uh, I, I guess I have a couple of questions while people are fuming and thinking right now. Uh, one is, and this is tricky since the Israel. Gaza story is so so intense and so unstable right now. But where where do you see free speech in academia headed over the next few years? Do you think, for example, that the 2024 election uh, is going to heighten free speech controversies mm -hmm. as both uh, leading candidates, Trump and Biden, have drawn attention to higher education in their campaigns and as the individual campuses become areas for mobilization, for support? Uh, do you think that... Um, uh, AI is likely to worsen or uh, benefit the free speech controversy. Look ahead a bit. Where where do you see this headed? Yeah. So let me let me try to answer the um, the electoral question because I think that the the coordinates I think seem to be changing. The for a long time, and I, you know there, there were questions about Rufo. We've talked about DeSantis in Florida. Uh, you know, for a long time it seemed uh, that the threat to free speech, uh, or there was a perceived threat to free speech from the so-called campus left. And various conservative politicians made a lot of this. It was valuable for them electorally, um, valuable for them as a kind of rhetoric. Um, what's happened in the immediate wake of the Israel-Gaza war, as far as I can tell with free speech on campus, has been uh, a crackdown on certain kinds of left-wing speech that mm -hmm. is severe. I mean, I think that the in the absence of uh, really strong uh, reasons, which I have not seen, they certainly haven't been made public, Columbia University's suspension of Jewish Voices for Peace and uh, Students for Justice in Palestine looks very much like a politically motivated crackdown on, on his favorite political speech. Um, and you know, to the extent that that is the case, and to the extent further that this crackdown is motivated by donor pressure mm -hmm. and there's another wonderful recent chronicle article that i recommend um by uh leela corwin berman uh and uh henry Soskin. i forget his first name um about the sort of the ways in which donors can exert pressure on uh, campuses mm -hmm. like this uh you know to the extent that that continues i think that the whole sort of political calculus will change um Republicans are not going to want to step in and say, we support the SJP. In fact, they've tried to make it genuinely illegal in Florida, though they're going to fail. Um, so it's going to it's going to compromise their capacity to um, to use campus freedom and free speech uh, as a kind of political tool. On the other hand, I think that it's going to compromise the capacity of the left uh, or whatever we want to call it, of the sort of campus sensitivity administrative class to continue to make uh, very uh, convincing prohibitions on the basis of sensitivity, mm. of various kinds. So, I, you know, I don't know. I think it will, I think it'll have a real, I think it'll really mix, mix the pot up in ways that will be fascinating to watch. Um, mm. And uh, 
that. My net, the column that comes out on Monday will be be about donor interference and the uh, suspension of these organizations. Uh, it's a truly fascinating situation. And there's a um, those of you who haven't seen it, there's a Guardian article about an event, uh, uh, an incident at Bard College, which happens to be my alma mater, but it's not why I mentioned. Uh, in which uh, you know we have a very explicit kind of donor interference that we know about only because it was resisted by the president of the college in which a class on apartheid in Israel, and the class was devoted to the question of whether apartheid is an appropriate label uh, for Israel's political arrangements. Uh, there was pressure to cancel it, including from a very, very big donor on the board of trustees who uh, was told to buzz off and to resign. Uh, and we know about that because it, it became public because it was rejected. But I think we can assume that versions of that pressure are happening across the university landscape right now, um, and it's going to have it's going to really it's going to really mix up how we think about campus speech and who's permitting it, who's projecting it, and so on. Perhaps to the extent that higher education increasingly has to rely on donors as our costs go up and the state support goes down. And as also general, the macroeconomic trend of increasing economic and wealth inequality means uh, we have more and more of such donors. Perhaps this will, this is a line that we need to keep an eye on. Yes, and one of the things that Leela points out is that not only do, do they rely on donors, but they rely on mega donors far more than ever. So a very small number of very wealthy donors that contribute a much higher uh, proportion of the pie than has historically been the case. So if one of them, so you know, this gives them enormous potential political power. Sure. You know. Well, thank thank you. That's a that's a really good point. If anyone wants to share a link to that in the chat, um, uh, that would be great. Uh, Ed Webb, our dear friend from uh, Dickinson College, uh, says there's also a structural problem that free speech has to be supported by financial security from the individual adjunct up to the donor dependent or state funded institution. Um, thank you, Ed. Uh, we have a, a video question from Mark. Uh, let me see if I can bring him up on stage. I think his camera is having issues. So this may be an audio only question. Uh, Mark, how are you doing, sir? Thanks. I'm doing well. I hope you all can hear me. Yeah, we um, can. So, uh, you know, I've been in higher ed for more than 20 years. And I guess what I always find fascinating about this, you know, free speech on campus is how students greatly outnumber faculty and staff. Hmm. And yet we expect these students, usually these young people, right, to come to campus already understanding what we are talking about and how we think about this. And the fact of the matter is that is simply hmm. Hmm. implausible. And I just invite all of us that are here and work at a college or university, how are you educating? How are the students being educated about this? Because it's just like, oh, it's the First Amendment. It's like, well, the First Amendment is 45 words, but we all know it goes way beyond that. And I just invite us to think about that. How are we getting the students to understand their role and our role in what this means? Oh, great question. Uh, please go ahead, Len, if you want to tackle that. Yeah, that's. I think it's a great question. I think I've wondered if uh, various kinds of orientation ought to be implemented around academic freedom and free speech, both. Oh, wow. I think that um, at at Stanford Law, after the uh, the sort of infamous Kyle Duncan incident, something like that was implemented by Jenny Martinez, mm -hmm. who was the dean of the law school at the time and who is now, I think, the provost of the entire university. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised, and maybe especially if these very fraught, uh, you know, very upsetting to students and faculty both uh, protests and counter protests over the war in the Middle East go on if incoming uh, classes or maybe students at the beginning of the next semester are orientated in some way. You know, this is how to protest appropriately. This is what you certainly can't do. Um, and so on. Um, that's I, I wouldn't be shocked in the personally. I think it would be a good idea for sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Mark, uh, thank you for that really good question. Uh, much appreciated. Um, and I appreciate all of this, but unfortunately, I have to do the opposite of showing appreciation, which is I have to draw our hour to a close because it is the end of our session. 
Um, Len, thank you so much for being just a great interlocutor, for sharing all of your ideas. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking with you. Um, I'm, I'm curious, what's, what's the best way to keep up with your work? Uh, should we uh, should we follow you on social media or should we uh, sign up for your uh, The newsletter? best way would be to sign up for my newsletter, which uh, I think if you go to the most recent one, it comes out every Monday morning and then will be published on the uh, it's published on the website of the Chronicle simultaneously. Um, and you can just go there and, you know, log in through your institutional Chronicle account and hit like subscribe. I think it's a little button at the top uh, and then I'll be in your inbox uh, and uh if if i'm showing up in the spam or promotions you know tell it go to the regular bit you know i'm, I'm supposed to tell everybody that it's it's supposed to affect well, it in some way and it happens uh yeah. you know, email defenses can be very rigorous <laughs> well please I, I i strongly recommend uh uh following lens columns because they're just they're just always thoughtful and always always good um thank you thank you so much for joining us much appreciated thank you so much for having me take care and good luck with the book too thank you uh, friends, thank you all for uh, for the great questions and great comments. This has been a real deep dive into a really fraught and tricky subject. I appreciate uh, all of you taking the time uh, to share all of your thoughts. If you'd like to continue uh, sharing those thoughts on social media, please just use the hashtag FTTE. Here are the places you can find me on Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, Blue Sky, and of course on my blog. If you'd like to go into our previous sessions where we've touched on these topics, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTFarchive or take a look at our forum website in order to find the topics that are coming up. Uh, thank you, everybody. I hope that uh, as we are heading towards late November, I hope those of you in the Northern Hemisphere are staying warm and those of you in the Southern Hemisphere are not too hot. Uh, please take care, everybody. Uh, be safe, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>